are going to get started in just a minute. I'm Diana Martin. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at Rodale Institute. And I am joined by the fabulous Marcy Zeroff, um, eco fashion pioneer. And we're going to be chatting with you all today about organic food, fiber, and fashion. So that's a, a really exciting conversation. It's actually one we, we usually focus on the food side at Rodale. So um, getting to talk about fashion today is a really fun change of pace. Um, I just wanted to let you all know that we plan to talk for around 40 minutes or so, um, and then we're going to take questions from you all. So please drop your questions in the Q&A. We'll be um, really excited to have Marcy answer those. And um, while you're here, we'd also love if you want to introduce yourself. So um, I see a couple of people starting to say hi in the chat. Um, please let us know where you're tuning in from, say hi, and think about some questions for Marcy. And it looks like we're <laughs> coming right up on our, we're starting right on time. We're very prompt. We're fashion, fashionably prompt we're today. <laughs> we're going to start a new, a new term around fashionably prompt. Yeah, yes. we're going to be fashionably, fashionably prompt. Um, I did want to note that you're probably expecting to see our dear friend, Max Goldberg, instead of me. Um, he, Max was originally supposed to help host this conversation today, and unfortunately, he can't be with us. So I just wanted to encourage you all to please check out the fabulous work that he does. Um, go to organicinsider.com, click the subscribe button. Um, Max does a huge service to our industry by delivering the best news about the organic industry right to your inbox. Um, so please check out the work that he does and subscribe. We're, we miss you, Max. So <laughs> sending love. Um, awesome. Well, as you guys think about some of your questions from RC, uh, we're just going to start diving in. Um, I just want to say it's such a pleasure to be hosting you actually here at the Rodale Institute farm today. So happy to be here. Um, it's and also to have you as part of our new ambassador network that we just launched. So it's really having you part of the family is a huge honor and, and hosting yeah. you today. Thank you. And it's so nice to be here. I started my career in organic food. So, you know, coming full circle back to my roots and I've, you know, been coming to the Rodell Institute for decades. So it's um, always loved being here. Well, it's, you've done so much in your career. I was thinking about how to even summarize that for the people <laughs> that are maybe new to this conversation. Um, and I guess the way I would summarize it is that when I think about organic fashion, I think of Marcy Zeroff. I think that's probably in a nutshell. And, you know, today you're at the helm of so many brands that you um, pioneered. I think, um, you know, you're sort of a serial entrepreneur. Um, and some of the brands that you're behind are things like Farm to Home and Metaware, Yes And. And I know that you actually have a new brand that you're launching in January on QVC, um, and that's called Seed to Style. So we're just really excited about that coming out in January. I guess I, I think it would just be beautiful if you could tell us more about your journey. How did you get involved in eco fashion and become such a champion of organic textiles and fashion. Yeah, so um, thank you and thanks for having me, Diana. Um, you know, it's been a long and winding road. Be careful what you wish for. No, just kidding. Um, it's, it's, you know, it started um, actually when I was 16 years old. Um, a girlfriend of mine gave me a book called Living in the Light by Shakti Gawain. Mm -hmm. And it struck a chord in me on a very deep level. And it just um, became a catalyst for me to dive into the environmental movement and the health and wellness movement. And this is back in the, in the eighties. Um, and I just, it felt right. It just like, why don't more people know about this? Mm -hmm. So when I graduated with a business degree um, from UC Berkeley, I started a school that did all health and environmental education. And I wanted to take people on a journey of self-realization and discovery to understand the why around starting with food, really. Mm -hmm. um, why does it matter? And 
So today, the school, which is known as the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, has certified over 100,000 people as health coaches. Wow. And the program is in, I believe, 125 or so countries around the world. Started out of my apartment. Um, but what became very clear to me as I was kind of deep in the trenches on agriculture was that all these crops were growing side by side, including cotton. Mm -hmm. And as I started to learn more about cotton, including the fact that cotton is one of the most heavily sprayed industries in agriculture, one of the biggest users of Roundup, which of course contains glyphosate, um, I started to look at, wait a minute, what are the health and environmental ramifications of cotton? Mm -hmm. And when I started to see that those impacts were pretty broad, um, from social to environmental, um, it, you know, it became apparent to me that there was this missing link in the wellness equation and you couldn't really support food without fiber. So I coined the term eco fashion in 1995 when I was three years old. No, um, and, uh, and I decided everything that I had learned on the food side, I was going to take and translate it into fashion. My background in fashion was limited from the business side, but mm -hmm. I was always a fashion consumer. I got best dressed in high school, so it was kind of like my passion. Um, everyone, I loved, I was an artist and I loved to style people, so it was just inherent. Um, and then when you study Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you understand that, you know, our first basic need as human beings is food, but now when you start to evolve and you plant the seed of consciousness, fiber, textiles are protection, you know, home and clothing are that next frontier mm -hmm. in the hierarchy of needs. So um, it, there were all these sort of signs pointing to there was an opportunity here to take food and translate it into fiber, specifically starting with cotton. So I started a brand in 1995 called Under the Canopy, and it was the first sustainable and organic uh, fashion and home brand. And because the market wasn't ready in terms of retail, you know, retailers still didn't really understand organic food at that time. Mm -hmm. We went direct to consumer back in the day when direct to consumer wasn't the internet necessarily, it was mail or catalogs. Remember, we were all flooded with catalogs and we were telling the organic story. And I was always very passionate about it um, coming from the food side and organic being sort of at the, you know, the foundation of the school. And so I, the more I learned, the more I wanted to share and tell those stories. So the under the canopy photo shoots were at Whole Foods. They were at farmer's markets. They were at Rodale. Um, Anthony Rodale was involved at the very beginning um, of the ride with under the canopy. And we uh, did t-shirts called the new farm and, you know, connecting the dots and telling those stories. And it, you know, it's really clear to me that, you know, as you start to learn more, um, you know, this is a lifestyle. This isn't about just food, just beauty, just fashion, you know, and, and fast forward, um, the last 25 years, I've been in the trenches writing standards. So we'll talk a little more later about the GOT standard, which I was on the team of people that wrote that in the nineties. Um, I've served on the board of directors of the organic trade association, currently on the board of trustees of the organic center, um, have been, you know, active in organic voices. Um, and just all things organic on, you know, food to fashion and fiber um, and other kind of new and innovative fibers that are starting to grow and get certified. Um, but, but across the board from, you know, the source all the way to the story um, and story, including a book I just came out with called Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy and sustainable world where I talk a lot about organic. And, uh, and also I produced a documentary film series called Driving Fashion Forward with Amber Valletta. And so I've just, um, this is my happy place and I'm very passionate about organic agriculture and how do we connect it to popular culture. Yeah, definitely. I'm curious what, um, you know, back in the 90s when you were introducing some of these brands, what was the reaction? I know <laughs> that, um, you know, we talk a lot at Rodale with farmers. And I've heard a lot of stories of farmers who were kind of ostracized by their community when they wanted to transition to organic. They were sort of seen as um, they were almost left out from their farming community. They were um, the strange person at their coffee shop. Um, and people really felt that they were doomed to failure. And um, a lot of farmers persevered over the decades because they felt like this was the right thing to do for their family, for their land. 
Um, I'm just curious, what was your reaction in the lifestyle and fashion space when you were starting to talk about a whole new way of really doing business? Yeah, so um, I love the quote from Albert Einstein, we can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created them, mm -hmm. right? So for me, telling that story relentlessly and tenaciously from the beginning was always kind of my mantra, break the stigmas, break the stigmas, that you have to give up style, that it's crunchy, frumpy, boxy, beige, boring, you know, and has no, like, no style. That was kind of one of the stigmas. Second stigma always was it's overpriced and, you know, most people could never afford organic uh, fashion or fiber and textiles. Um, and the third stigma was how do we really know that it's organic, you know, when mm -hmm. it comes to textiles, which we can speak to in terms of that transparency model. Um, but, you know, when I started, I felt like a bit schizophrenic in a way um, because I was in the natural products industry, having come out of mm -hmm. the organic food world. And those were my peeps and so my tribe. And so, you know, I'd go to um, Expo and I would be like, you know, among my people and very happy and excited about, you know, connecting the dots and people like, yes, I get it. But then I would go to fashion conferences and, and, you know, events and everybody would look at me like I was absolutely insane. Like, why would anybody ever want to wear stuff that's environmentally friendly or organic? Because, you know, if you're into style and you're, you want that sort of, you know, look good sensibility, then there was this, again, kind of prejudice around, well, we're giving something up, we're, you know, sacrificing and, and, so there was kind of this watch your back kind of sensibility in fashion where people didn't collaborate. They weren't in it for the common good. They were in it for the me. Whereas mm -hmm. in the natural products industry, it was much, very much about, I've got your back. We're all in this together. Mm -hmm. So bridging the tribe and the fashionista and the boardroom, um, you know, with um, the, you know, the whole organic world you know that was really always kind of my goal was to bridge the worlds that i was living in and that even though they're dichotomous worlds right one is very material and one is very spiritual and consciousness driven mm -hmm. that they're not mutually exclusive and you can bring them together so that you can look good feel good and do good at the same time that's like the real triple bottom line right so, there <laughs> five keys people planet profit passion and purpose yeah i love that well, let's talk a little bit about sort of the problem. Um, you know, I, I often hear that fashion can be a really destructive industry. And um, I think a lot of us who are really working a lot in organic food, we see sort of the parallels we see in, um, you know, we're paying for this cheap food in so many other ways through our environment or health. Can you help me understand what some of the dangers are of fast fashion and some of the, the cheap clothing that we um, have really is now being mass produced and is kind of available on every um, shopping mall and every time you log in online. Um, help us understand what some, some of the really pressing issues are around fast fashion. Yeah, so you know, people always think about you are what you eat, right? But mm -hmm. when we start to pull the curtain back and unveil the human and environmental impacts of fashion, um, they're very pervasive and they're very serious. So you've got kind of different spokes on the wheel. So you have water, waste, mm -hmm. energy, climate change, and social justice are kind of the key ones. Um, so first of all, climate change, fashion represents, and you'll see different numbers here, depending on what gets included of transportation and agriculture, mm -hmm. but anywhere from eight to 10% of the world's carbon footprint is coming out of the fashion industry. Wow. So when you look at the amount of fossil fuels that are being burned, the amount of water that's being used, I mean, 20% of the world's freshwater pollution is coming from textile treatment and dyeing. And fashion is one of the biggest polluters in air and water um, of all industries, in fact, Again, you'll see different statistics, you know, anywhere from the second to fifth largest polluter in the world. Um, and you'll, you'll see numbers that, you know, 5% of our textile um, and la or landfill waste is textiles. Um, you know, when, when the fashion industry was really a young industry, you would see two seasons a year, right? Spring, summer, fall, winter. Fast fashion brought over 52 seasons a year. So you think of the proliferation of you know textiles that are out there and so many of them are synthetic and synthetics never biodegrade 
So what happens is, is every time you wash that synthetic outfit, that shirt, that jacket, um, little microfibers are shedding into our washing machines, which are shedding into our water systems, our rivers, ultimately in our oceans. And today you will see numbers as big as 90% of fish have traces of microfibers in them. Wow. So all of that plastic pollution from synthetics is just going into our environment, which are of course endocrine disruptors and the fish are eating them. And so it's a, it's a very serious issue that didn't, you know, it used to be that the fear of eating fish was mercury poisoning. But now you're literally eating plastic potentially mm -hmm. when you eat fish. So um, in addition to that, you know, we've destroyed our, our soil. Um, you know, cotton is about a third of the world's textiles and um, less than 1% of the world's cotton is organic. So that means, you know, you've got a lot of cotton out there that is GMO seeds mm -hmm. um, ridden with toxic uh, fertilizers and chemical insecticides, pesticides, um, you have the breakdown of soil, which ultimately, as we'll speak to, I'm sure, further, you know, uh, destroys its ability to act as the skin of the earth and capture carbon, mm -hmm. right? So when it becomes dirt, all that toxic runoff goes into the water systems. And especially in, you know, in third world countries where, um, you know, the devastation around cotton is, is something people don't think about. You know, you hear milk is a natural, but then when you pull the curtain back, if it's not organic and you see steroids and antibiotics and hormones, yeah. well, people think cotton is a natural fiber, right? But when you pull the curtain back on cotton and you look at the magnitude and multitude of chemicals going into the growing and the sewing, not to mention then the finishing and the dyeing, it's a very toxic product. Yeah, cotton is one of those, it's sort of a, a super sprayer crop. It's a crop that needs a lot of, uh, in conventional agriculture, uses a lot of pesticides. It does. Less than 3% of the world's agriculture is cotton. And you'll see, again, these statistics vary, but you know, you'll see 8 to 10% of the world's pesticide use is on cotton um, or insecticide use. You'll see up to 20% of uh, insecticide use, sorry, 10% pesticide use, 20% insecticide use. It's just very toxic when it comes to the kinds of sprays as well. Some of the most carcinogenic sprays are used on the cotton industry because the boll weevil is a, you know, is a bad guy. Um, but there's ways to contain it when you understand kind of the whole Rodell Institute philosophy, right? Healthy soil builds healthy plants, builds healthy people. And when we build healthy soil, it's the equivalent of building our immune system as human beings. So, you know, we want those plants to be resistant to those boll weevils and other bugs and germs. And we can do that through crop rotation and through cover cropping and green manure and, and really building the soil um, and versus depleting it and destroying it, which is the basis of conventional cotton today. Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about um, organic food and its connection to our health but really organic fashion and fiber has a huge connection to our health. We're seeing these um, destructive fashions are, are um, you know, threatening the water that we drink, but even those um, pesticides and cotton, and we're putting these garments on our skin, which is our largest organ. Is that something that you, you know, think about as far as the health impacts of Absolutely. this organic fashion? Absolutely. So, as you mentioned, the skin is the largest organ in our body. It's our primary organ for absorption. And so, you know, people haven't historically stopped to think, we're basically in textiles 24 seven. If you add your sheets and your towels and your robes and you know, mm -hmm. what you're wearing around the house, then it's your t-shirts and your denim and your jackets and dresses and right. So, you know, when you think about what's going into the production of the growing and the manufacturing or processing of cotton, and that being against your skin, you're talking about thousands and thousands of chemicals, right, that are in the textile supply chain today. And, you know, 70 million people in our country alone have asthma and allergies and skin sensitivities. And, you know, a third of the population, you'll see that number. And it's, you know, it's not just what we put in, it's what we put on. And I've seen firsthand, because Under the Canopy was started as a mail order catalog, you know, we would take calls from customers and, and actually every once in a while I would sit on calls to really listen to why they were attracted to organic in the 90s, right, before it was kind of a known thing. And, you know, a lot of people said that's all they can wear or use in their mm -hmm. homes because 
they would just react to synthetics and other chemicals. And then you see the whole American Airlines debacle that happened a couple of years ago around, you know, uniforms that were creating reactions on stewardesses and stewards. And, and you know, um, they started to realize, whoa, wait a minute, all these synthetic textiles actually are affecting our, our state of health and well-being. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the farmer health and wellness and their welfare. And, you know, you would see after spraying seasons, just the, the amount of respiratory conditions, skin you know, issues from the spraying. A lot of farmers, especially in third world countries like India, are spraying manually with pesticide tanks on their backs. Right. And oftentimes with babies in slings, the women would carry their babies on their front with pesticide ta uh, tanks on their backs and wouldn't know that there was a, a problem with that. So, you know, there's, there's so many um, health considerations and, you know, my whole kind of philosophy has always been to show and, and prove it's not why would you buy organic fiber and textiles? It's why wouldn't you? If you can have everything you want in the way of great quality products, style and quality, as well as great price and you can afford it and it's everything you want, then it's, you know, it's not a choice. It's an imperative, right? Let's talk about flipping that on its head. What is the... Um what are farms and fashion brands who are using organic and regenerative practices, like the brands that you're at the head of, what do those look like? How is that kind of the 180 of this kind of this broader fast fashion that we're seeing? Yeah, so, um, so right now as part of Eco Fashion Corp, which I'm the founder and CEO, and um, we have uh, a greenhouse of brands and we have MetaWare. So MetaWare is our I would say our foundational kind of uh, platform. We make everything from farm to finished product fully transparent. Um, we uh, embed certifications and marketing communication strategies so that we connect source to story. And we never use conventional cotton. Um, we use either cotton that's in transition to organic. That's been a new frontier of ours with a program we call Reset, Regenerate the Environment, Society, and Economy Through Textiles, where we're helping farmers transition to organic. And then, of course, all of our certified organic is certified to the National Organic Program. And then um, everything in the product is uh, certified through a GOT certified uh, transparency model. Every factory that we uh, work in is certified to the GOT standard. Right now, there are, we have the biggest growth ever in the uh, global GOTS market of factories that have now come on board to be GOTS certified. Um, so when you have a finished textile that is organic in our brands, um, it has been vetted not just at the farm level with the organic cotton, but everything added to the product and every factory touching the product. So there's social compliance. I mean, the GOTS standard, the sixth version just came out and it includes you know, a pretty hefty list of social standards as well as environmental standards. Mm. Um, so it is the platinum standard for an organic textile. Um, but our brands, yes and, are direct to consumer. So you can be assured that everything is certified organic, again, farm to consumer. And then we have two brands on QVC, as you mentioned earlier, one is called Farm to Home, all certified organic home products, where we get to educate the consumer and talk about why organic matters. And then we have a new brand launching in January called Seed to Style, which is all organic fashion, again, farm to finish products. So super excited. Yeah, we will, um, we'll send out a recording of this to everyone who's watching and we'll be sure to drop the links into those brands. So everyone who wants to check them out, will definitely follow. Awesome. Um, you were mentioning the GOT, um, the GOT certification. Let's talk about that for a minute. Sure. Um, all of our viewers might not be familiar with it. That's the Global Organic Textile Standard. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with that abbreviation. So for those of us who are living here in the United States, um, our, we had something called the National Food Production Act that was passed in 1990. And that is what made our National Organic Program and the sort of that USDA certified organic symbol that you see on all of your food products today. Um, but that standard um, and, and the law was really written for food and commodities. So. Um, it was focused on food and it would certify, it would certify something like cotton or, or wool as organic. But then, as you know, those products go through a, a many more steps and to be processed and actually turned into something that we wear. So I think that that was sort of the, um, the reason for establishing this um, organic textile standard 
But I'd love to hear more because I know you played a huge role in establishing that standard of why we needed it, what does it mean, um, and what should people look for at home to know that something they're buying is meeting these top standards? Yeah. Um, so just starting with why can't we use the National Organic Program, organic seal that people recognize on your food products, right? Mm -hmm. That's because, and you kind of touched on this, the 5% allowances are, are all specific to the food space. So in our world, in the world of textiles, we have dyes, we have finishes, we have other considerations, but they weren't taken into account when the organic food standard was written mm -hmm. and the National Organic Program was created. So what we did as part of the Organic Trade Association in the 90s is we created an organic fiber council. Um, it was a tiny little group of us and, um, just a big shout out to Sandra Markhart. And we go back, uh, back in the day from when we were in the trenches and, and on a very tiny little group of people that wrote an organic textile standard to counter the organic food standard. And that would look at and, and take into consideration all of the things that we need in those 5% allowances. But what we discovered was that, you know, with textiles crossing boundaries and borders globally every day, that it became very confusing to have a standard in the US. Mm -hmm. What if that same product is going to the UK or that product is you know, made in other countries? How do you monitor that? The UK through the Soil Association had their own organic fiber textile standard, as did JOCA in Japan, as did IBN in Germany. So those four countries, traded organizations, we all came together and we birthed the global organic textile standard and we worked through all the differences and tried to kind of find a common ground to create a uniform standard that would cross all global boundaries and that was a six-year process and that ultimately became the global organic textile standard and today it's been adopted worldwide and the USDA has recognized the GOT standard as the equivalent to the organic food standard um, they're not monitoring it from a federal regulation standpoint at the same level because they don't really have the understanding of finished textiles. So they often point to the Federal Trade Commission, whose job it is to protect the American consumer from mismarketing. But the Federal Trade Commission, you know, points back to the USDA and says, but you monitor the organic program. So it's kind of a still in a bit of a limbo stage, but there have been a couple lawsuits filed against mismarketing of GOTS, um, and there's a lot of self-policing in our industry, but the beauty of the GOTS standard, um, and I would just say, you know, it's, it's similar to the food standard, but in our world, as I said, what it does look at is there's no chlorine bleach, there's no formaldehyde, there's no heavy metals, no acetone, um, even the packaging is all, you know, sustainable packaging, so um, post-consumer recycled paper, um, you know, we use, um, you know, no PVC. So there's a lot of um, considerations from the uh, inputs side on the GOT standard, as well as, of course, as you mentioned, the cotton itself is grown no differently than if you were growing lentils or lettuce next to it in terms of uh, the growing requirements and the methodologies mm -hmm. of organic agriculture. Um, but where the differences start is once you go beyond that. So... And what, what are some of the main um, fibers that people are using now for organic fashion? Obviously, cotton is going to be a big one, but, you know, hemp is on the rise. Are we seeing more organic hemp Just started. production? And, yeah, what are some of the other, I, I would think wool would probably yeah. be, but I'm just curious if there's some, what kind of fibers people are using in the organic fashion space. Yeah, so to date, I would say you're really looking at cotton, wool, linen, um, hemp, silk has been um, grown organically. Um, and there's a lot of very interesting new innovation happening on the fiber side. Um, I'm not aware of any certified organic yet because a lot of these innovations are still new, but they're food based. So you have pineapple, you have mushrooms, you have seaweed, you have, um, all kinds of really cool things that are kind of happening. Banana. Wow. Um, so there's opportunity. And of course, you know, organic leather um, to, you know, when you have leather as a byproduct of the meat industry, of course, as the rise of the, you know, organic um, meat industry um, has continued to accelerate, you see all those hides available. And so now there is a, um, the birth of a regenerative and organic 
leather industry out of that. Um, so I think we're, you know, just scratching the surface and with 83% of Americans today eating organic food, you know, there is so much opportunity now to connect those dots and start to really educate and activate consumers that this is a very important next step. And 60% of a cotton plant, which a lot of people don't know this, actually goes into the food stream. Wow. So if you're not supporting organic cotton and you're using regular cotton into the food stream, it's very heavily ridden with pesticides and, and chemicals and things like breads, snack foods. I mean, if you turn over and you read the labels on conventional goods that aren't organic, cottonseed oil is a major ingredient. Wow. So, you know, 60% goes into for oil, also for feed for dairy. So cottonseed is a very common ingredient in dairy uh, feed. Okay. So. And, yeah, so another reason to eat organic, right? Absolutely. Um, well, let's talk about, you mentioned the consumer. Um, one thing that's really exciting, uh, just in, in 2019, here in the United States, um, organic non-food sales, so non-organic, um, things that are organic but they're not food, hit $5 billion for the first time. So 2019, $5 billion in the US of organic non-food sales. Um, the leader of that was definitely fiber. And it's actually these organic non-food items are growing, the sales are going at a faster rate than organic food. So I think that that's pretty exciting. I'm, I'm curious from your standpoint about what's driving that demand now for these organic non-food items. And what are you hearing from consumers about why they're looking for these products? Absolutely. So as you touched on, you know, organic um, non-food had over 9% growth um, as opposed to 5% growth on the food side. And um, according to the Organic Trade Association study, uh, the organic industry in America just broke 55.1 billion in 2019. So, you know, we're definitely crossing over big time into mainstream. And I joke a lot about there was a day where everyone in the organic industry knew each other. And today, you know, the internet has changed the entire game. Mm -hmm. And because you can pull the curtain back and not only ask the question, where's my food coming from and how's it being grown and, you know, what's in it, right? Which really was the catalyst for the farm to table movement. You now have this fashion revolution happening where you know people are asking that same question who made my clothes how are they being made what's in them who's growing them who's making them and part of that was started the fashion revolution movement was sort of a, i would say propelled by what happened in Ron, uh, rana plaza in bangladesh um in 2013 when the um factory collapsed mm -hmm. and 1133 workers lost their lives instantly and it just caused an uproar globally. And all of a sudden, people who were never paying attention to the fashion industry started to say, wait a minute, business as usual is not okay. There's slave labor and horrific working conditions. And then taking that deeper into the farms and looking at you know, farmers struggling to put food on the table and you know, support their livelihoods. Because you know, as fast fashion has continued to you know, impose on you know, our, our world, essentially the, those who have been crammed on the worst are the farmers and the workers, right? And, you know, they're still making their margins at the retail level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, the consumer of today is a lot better educated because of the internet. Um, they can, you know, Google obviously, and they're demanding transparency. And that in and of itself is is really is what the game changer really is um you can ask the questions and now you can get the answers so brands are finally being held accountable and i mean even over covid there was a lot of noise being made around you know hashtag pay up because you know a lot of retailers and brands were just essentially canceling orders with no consideration for the workers and the farmers and how they'd be affected factories and and farmers um, based on all these billions of dollars in cancellations. And so, you know, that accountability has been sparked by our ability to come together um, and drive community and collaboration globally around, you know, making sure that brands and designers and retailers are held accountable. We, I think we see that. Can, one thing that's interesting, you mentioned the transparency I think um, now really all the way down to the farm level, which mm -hmm. I think that's probably a little bit on the newer side. Um, some responsible brands 
have been, you know, telling us more about factories where the goods are produced. But I think even tracing the commodities back to farms and how those farms and farm workers have been treated, um, I think that there's also a growing demand from that from consumers. Definitely. And social media is like the greatest tool ever because, you know, for so many years, our biggest challenge was how do we tell these stories at retail, right? Like how do we, you know, differentiate ourselves in organic from non-organic when they're throwing organic product on the back corner, just kind of like a, the ugly stepchild, the token, like, okay, we have a t-shirt that's made of organic cotton. Um, but now, you know, not just the accountability from, you know, the, the pressure of these movements like fashion revolution, but just any consumer out there today can tell stories on their social media influencers. And um, obviously, you know, we want positive stories to tell, but negative stories are, can be devastating to brands, right? So, you know, the deeper we go into the supply chain, the better we understand, you know, all those questions that consumers are looking for answers on. And blockchain technology is another game changer because we're going to have the ability and we're starting to mm -hmm. um, embark on this, you know, to not only capture, you know, who is the farmer and let's make that farmer cool, but, um, and tell that farmer story, but we can also capture impact data. And we can look at, you know, pesticide use, and we can look at water retention, and we can look at climate um, and how, you know, uh, carbon is being sequestered or not into the soil. And, and the two things that farmers are most concerned about from my travels around the world are their livelihoods, you know, supporting their families mm -hmm. and making sure that they can survive, which in a conventional system today, it's so broken that they can't. Um, and climate change resilience, which they're terrified. They're seeing it firsthand, an increase in, you know, monsoons and, and all these, you know, natural disasters. And they're mm -hmm. scared because the, the, the crops and the plants are not strong enough to sustain these winds and these storms. And they're losing, it's wiping out their entire farm, one storm. So, you know, there's, those are serious considerations. So that I think farmers more than ever are, um, receptive to these practices and I think consumers are driving you know and paving the way for that because they're demanding this. How do we make that for the average consumer how do we make that connection between organic food and this broader organic lifestyle? I know that there's you know there's so many people out there today that, um, that value organic food they think about it when they're at the, the supermarket checkout but they maybe don't translate that to these other areas of their life. Um, I'm just from your experience, how do, we, um, how do we make that connection and how do we bring people from the food to the lifestyle? We're here. This is like, <laughs> there couldn't be a better example of this moment in time, literally. Um, you know, it really is education and, and helping people understand that, you know, they get that their food isn't growing in the supermarket but they still don't necessarily get that their clothing isn't growing in the department store, right? That, that people's lives and the, our environment are being affected by the choices we're making. And if we're gonna vote with our dollars and you know, protect human health and you know, farmer and worker welfare and future generations, we have to look at this holistically. We have to look at the ecosystem and we have to educate people that that ecosystem, especially when you're talking about organic methodologies, it starts at the source and it's very metaphoric for the fact that you know our own sense of consciousness starts at our own source the light within us right mm -hmm. so you know as jonathan swift once said vision is the art of seeing things invisible but it's really not outside of us it's inside of us all the answers right so when you tap into that truth or that light you know if you ask somebody you know if you had the choice to buy and support a product or a brand that was making a difference to human and environmental wellness and future generations, but you didn't have to give up anything. It's yes, you can have everything you want and you can be a part of, you know, doing good in the world. Then, you know, would, would you still go and choose something that you knew was destructive and, and depleting and unhealthy and, you know, and perpetuating this broken system of an industry that is ultimately destroying our planet and our future for our children and our children's children. So, you know, it's not even about sustainability anymore, frankly, it's about regeneration. We have to rebuild. And that's a big part of the story. And, 
um, where I think, you know, the Rodale Institute's work with the regenerative organic um, standard is, is so paramount and so important. That is like the gold star, the North star, you know, to get to a place where we are practicing, you know, truly sustainable methods of agriculture and where we are building and protecting our soil, um, our farmers and our futures. Yeah, I mean, really sustainability isn't good enough anymore. Exactly. Um, and just to kind of distill what you're saying, it's really the same reasons you would buy organic food are the same reasons you would support organic fiber and fashion it's for your own health, for the environment, and really for the, for the workers and farmers who are producing that good. That's right. So as much as you care about those things in the food aisle, we have to translate that to the rest of our lives and lifestyles. And you know, because I started in food, you know, one thing that was interesting to me when I, when I sort of segued into the fashion and fiber space was it's almost an easier story because you know, it's changed a lot with the, you know, expansion into the Costco's and the Target's and the Walmart's of the world and, you know, who are now the biggest buyers of organic food, um, and of course, Amazon. And, um, but, you know, today's consumer really, they want to, to do the right thing, but the challenge really has been accessibility mm -hmm. um, and just fear that they have to, like, give up something or they're going to be deprived. And food you know, especially in the earlier years, was scary to people. Like, what happens when I travel? What do I do when I go to my friends' houses? How do I, you know, I don't, I don't recognize these brands. I don't know what to look for. I don't, whereas fashion is one of these, you know, look for the seal, the label, like a goth seal, um, which says, you know, it's fully audited and transparent and authentic. Um, but it's also, you're not really giving anything up. You, you're just, as long as you know and trust the brand and the products that you're buying, then really it's, again, I said this earlier, and I'm just, it's such a strong point to think about is not why, but why not? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost when you think of um, how many impacts there are from the fashion industry and that it touches everybody's lives, um, everybody relates to textiles because everybody wears them and uses them. So you know, that sort of next frontier, that, that consumer of today that's growing up on the internet, especially the millennial, where 52% of organic food shoppers are millennials, right? They're growing up where that word is more of a household word. Sure. So when you say organic fashion, it's no longer like, huh, what, why? It's like, of course, yay, finally. So we're on our way. Well, I want to make sure we, let's kick it back over to our audience. I've been seeing the Q&A pinging. So I know that you guys all have some questions at home that you're really anxious to ask, ask Marcy. Uh, I'm going to invite my colleague Lauren onto the screen and she is going to, um, hi Lauren, she's hi, actually Lauren. sitting outside on our beautiful <laughs> farm and um, Lauren's going to help feed some of our questions from you to Marcy and then um, after that we'll wrap by talking a little bit about what the, the future looks like. So awesome. excited to talk about that. Cool. Okay, so a lot of questions have been coming in through the Q&A in the chat. So everyone who wants to ask a question, you can just drop it in the Q&A or the chat and we'll get to it. But I'm gonna start with some questions that have been coming in through this webinar. So the first that um, someone asked, Professor Srinivasa, I hope I'm saying that uh, kind of correct. She said, similar to organic cotton, is there an organic silk production? If so, where is it produced across the world? And what is the potential of marketing of organic cotton and organic silk? Organic yeah. cotton and organic silk, yeah. Yeah, so um, one of my favorite places I've ever been in my life was this incredible organic silk farm in Cambodia. Um, generally speaking, you, you know, the organic silk you'll find are from more, a smaller, um, uh, initiatives there there isn't kind of mass production of organic silk um to date so you know it, it is more limited um but generally speaking you know it means it's kind of like free range or you know uh organic meat in the sense that you know the silkworms are roaming free on the mulberry bushes which are not sprayed and you know there's kind of a you know a a process in there that there's no chemicals added but you know the silk process in and of itself is in order to get the silk you obviously have to boil the silkworm so it's not considered vegan but in terms of organic 
as long as there's no sprays and no chemicals and um, and everything is you know on the mulberry bush or grown in accordance with um, organic principles, you can get certified organic silk. Um, and there are again, there are also you know considerations on the treatment of the silkworms and so on up through up to the end game. But yes, there there is some organic silk. And I would say again, limited um, where you'll find it, but predominantly in Asia. So cool. I've never heard of that before. Um, okay, so we have a few questions that are kind of around the same topic of um, personal and like consumerism. So someone asked how to find refurbished clothing in one place. Um, that was Joe from Southwest Kansas. And Emily asked, what are some of your go-to low-cost organic cotton brands? So those are, I think, more like recommendations or ideas like yeah. that. How do people start their organic shopping, fashion shopping journey? <laughs> yes, good question. Um, so I think, you know, relatively speaking, when you look at organic cotton versus organic um, food, there's certainly, it's more limited. We're still at our infancy, even 25 years in the making doing this. Um, but there are some wonderful brands. So I'll start with on the home side. Um, of course, I'll give a shout out to Farm to Home, which is on QVC, um, and QVC has done an amazing job. So we have limited merchandise left, but um, there's a whole new collection of organic textiles coming in January, um, and this holiday, there'll be some new um, items coming in. You also have brands like Koyuchi, Bull and Branch, um, that are also amazing home brands. Then when you move into the organic uh, apparel, side you have brands like packed um groceries apparel of course yes and which is at joinyesand.com uh which is our newest brand um you have uh prana and outer known and of course patagonia um are probably the big ones athleta has started introducing organic um and there are just i mean fisher um, there are a number of really amazing organic uh, clothing brands out there and more springing up every single day. You know, I get very excited and kind of pinch myself um, given that I've landed, you know, I've been on both the food and the fiber side and have seen just such an increase in entrepreneurs that are uh, incorporating organic food into, you know, their food products and brands. But similarly on the fashion side, you know, when I used to speak at fashion institutes like FIT or Parsons, there were, um, you know, most people would be on their cell phones probably ignoring me. But today, you know, there are entire tracks and majors in sustainable fashion and organic is a big part of that. So this new wave of designers that are entering the market and starting brands are all looking at their fibers and organic cotton is kind of at the, you know, at the foundation of a lot of these young brands. Um, you also see brands and, and major retailers like Target and, um, and uh, of course, Amazon and, as I mentioned, QVC that are introducing their own private label brands um, that include organic. So lots of opportunity just getting started. Yeah. Once they find those brands, then I know people in the Q&A, a lot of them asked about affordability. Um, so one person, Samina, they asked, how many people can actually afford organic fashion and what steps, what steps are being taken to make it more affordable? Yeah, great question. And it's been one of the stigmas of organic clothing is that it's for the elite. And if you look at the, you know, parallel back in, in, you know, the early years of the organic food movement, you know, the running joke was whole paycheck, right? If you bought organic food, you know, you couldn't buy anything else in your life because you spent all your money on your food. But over time, you know, we've clearly um, scaled the organic food movement, you know, $55 billion industry today, right, in the U.S. And we're looking at, you know, the biggest uh, buyer of organic food in the United States is Costco. And so that tells you that prices have, you know, as the demand and supply have, you know, caught up, you've got, you know, greater accessibility with much more affordable organic food. Well, similarly, we're seeing that on the textile side. In the early years of organic textiles, you know, we had, we had no efficiencies. We had no economies of scale. We had, you know, limited farms. We had one-off small productions. And that adds up because when you can't amortize the raw material over the course of a larger production, 
that differential at the farm gate, if there's a premium on the cotton, is gonna show up in a lot more pronounced way than when you're doing a larger production. But one of the things that I think a lot of brands and companies have figured out, um, which has absolutely brought the cost down of organic clothing and, and home textiles, is the fact that we can start at the farm and we can build up the supply chain from farm to finished product and cut out a lot of the inefficiencies that exist in a typical garment supply chain. So as an example, a garment can change hands seven to 10 times in a supply chain when it goes from the farm to the gin, to the spinning, to the knitting or weaving, to the cutting and sewing, the dyeing, the finishing, the packaging, the logistics and freight, and so on, right? So when you look at how do we create the most vertically integrated supply chain possible that's managed starting at the farm, which was completely foreign to most fashion and uh, companies, brands and retailers for, you know, until the last maybe five or 10 years, um, they would just go right to the factory and the factory would build out the supply chain and all those brokers and middlemen, one was selling their cotton to the spinner. The spinner was then, sell, you know, a broker would sell yarn to a knitter and all those markups were in the supply chain and that organic cotton markup was going up the whole supply chain. So the end product just wasn't accessible to most people. Today, it's a very different uh, ball game. And that's, you know, one of the things we focus most on at MetaWare and at Eco Fashion Corp. And yes, and is in Farm to Home on QVC is the fact that we are farm to finish product, fully vertically integrated, and that those efficiencies can be seen by the fact that we're competitive on price. And oh, by the way, we're adding value by being organic certified and of course, ethically made. And is one of the goals with organic fashion that Maybe it's just moving away from this model of fast fashion. You can have better quality goods that last over time and you're maybe not replacing a cheap shirt every, you know, seven wears because it just didn't hold its shape. And Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of those textiles that are, that are part of the fast fashion movement are, you know, using um, synthetics and blends. I mean, I've seen so much greenwashing where, you know, a brand might say, well, we have 1% organic cotton. And then, you know, read the label, because that's very telling, right? Like when you see a label that it's organic cotton blended with rayon or blended with something that is so toxic, you kind of got to ask yourself, A, do I really even trust that this is real organic cotton? Because unfortunately, there is still cheating going on, some intentional, some unintentional. And, you know, when you see a t-shirt selling it, you know, Two ninety nine, and there's a claim that there's a, it's organic. I would be um, very skeptical, mm -hmm. right? Because ultimately, there is a higher cost on the farm level, and consumers today, fortunately, care and they want to vote with their dollars, and they want to know that they can, you know, have that um, authenticity and transparency and assurance. And that's why I'm such an advocate for the GOP certification and ultimately the ROC is to, to show that traceability from the farm. Um, and so, you know, who the brands that you're buying, the products that you're buying, the companies you're supporting is a part of making the decision. Make sure you read about their values because if they are gonna be promoting organic as a part of their collection, you know, make sure it's not just some, you know, greenwashing marketing proposition and that it actually has substance behind it. You know, I always say it's not even about making, you know, fashion sustainable and organic. It's about making organic and sustainability fashionable, but at the same time, protecting the integrity of, you know, the authenticity of, you know, the finished products. Lauren, do you have one more question you want to give us from the audience? Yeah, sure. I can, um, I can definitely find one more. Sorry if there's some sound. There's a tractor running. The joys of being farm. I love it. The full I, farm experience. We're just living vicariously through you. We'll be outside shortly. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, one question that I thought was great for a final question is from Shannon, um, who first thanked you for blazing a trail and said that you're a bright light, which is so lovely. And then um, they said, you've connected so many dots in the organic space. What do you feel is the next frontier? So, you know, I, it's interesting because my book, Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy, and sustainable world, um, 
you know, was written with the lens of the eco-renaissance as a movement. And when you, when you talk about, you know, what is a renaissance, a renaissance is a rebirth. And it's a rebirth of, you know, humanity kind of mimicking the original renaissance where, you know, the pillars, I would say, of, of what I'm calling the eco-renaissance are creativity, consciousness, community, collaboration, and connection. Um, and so I, I really believe this awakening that's happening. And I, I love that, you know, the gift, and I always kind of look at like, what's the reason for being or what's the gift in every moment is COVID-19, I think, has forced people to start to go inside and reset their own priorities and think differently about the choices they're making. And they want to make healthier and better choices. So the organic food you know, market, we're seeing an increase. And organic textiles, we're seeing an increase, fortunately, because I think people are, you know, waking up. And I love that word, you know, hashtag woke, right? Where, you know, you realize that it is about yes and, that you can have it all. You can vote with your dollars. You can make a difference, every single one of us. And the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. So as long as we're all stepping in the right direction, you know, and we're, and we're redesigning a new reality, recreating and, um, a new reality, then we can wear the change we wish to see. We can drive an eco-renaissance. We can connect the dots between food and beauty and fashion and business. We can shift the paradigm. And then the end game is we can change the alternative from the norm and the norm to the alternative. So that organic is no longer, you know, a... In, in, in a choice, it's an imperative that we're all buying and shopping organically um, going forward. So that's my kind of wish for humanity. And I do think, um, you know, what's next is more innovation around, you know, organic materials and by the use of biomass and, you know, really cool fibers um, that are certified organic and, you know, more brands moving towards organic and regenerative cotton and away from, you know, all the greenwashing that's going on around conventional cotton and the big sustainability bows on certain cotton that isn't certified or on some kind of continuum. And, you know, a lot of brands don't know what they're doing yet. So, you know, it's kind of all hands on deck right now. Um, and the fashion revolution has been such an amazing force to help educate and inspire um, active, you know, activism and transparency in our movement. So thank you. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thanks for bringing the audience questions and everyone who asked them. No problem. Well, as we look towards um, wrapping our discussion, I do want to ask you two final questions. Of course. Um, but I do want to just first thank you for joining us on this conversation about organic fashion and fiber. I think, uh, you know, a lot of our audience is probably rethinking their whole wardrobe right now and really how they can have an impact through those decisions and choices. Um, so uh, fast, two fast questions. We'll do a, a lightning round. Okay. Um, <laughs> number one, uh, to see a more regenerative and organic fashion industry, uh, what, what are the, what's the role of the consumer? What's the role of the brand? And what's the role of the farmer? How would you want to see those, those three groups? kind of move forward and push us in that direction? Yeah, so, you know, there really is, um, there needs to be a convergence of all of those kind of moving parts, right? I always say one plus one equals 11 because <laughs> we're stronger together than we are apart. And that therein lies kind of what was the, um, you know, the, the impetus for starting MetaWare was to make organic and sustainable fashion easy for other brands and companies and retailers by essentially connecting the farmer and helping to train them and educate them about the why, which is super important because they don't necessarily get it. You kind of, we take for granted across the world that farmers understand the importance, but when they're lured in by the GMO seed and chemical companies told, you know, these glamorous visions of better yields and, you know, you're going to have more cotton, you're going to make more money. But what happens is, these cottons get, these farmers get stuck on the pesticide treadmills mm -hmm. and they, you know, ultimately they destroy their soil. The bugs become, you know, more rampant and they have to up the ante on the use of their chemicals, which is more expensive. They leverage their farms to the banks that, oh, by the way, are in partnership with the seed companies and the chemical companies. And ultimately every half an hour in India, a conventional cotton farmer is committing suicide 
by drinking pesticides. And it's like this statement that's just devastating. So what can the consumer do is get educated, understand the power of your every decision that you make, every shirt that you buy, every brand that you support, and vote with your dollars and spread the word. And when you find great products and brands that you love, share that love. You know, share it on your social media, share it digitally, um, and you know, and tell those great stories. Because it's not storytelling, actually, it's story doing. And and then I would say, you know, um, it's up to the brands and the retailers to respond to that growing demand from today's consumer. So it all works together in this ecosystem where you know the farmers absolutely as they learn they will scale if they know the demand is there mm -hmm. the the consumer is now searching um in fact um keywords around sustainability increased 75 percent in uh year over year this past year and in organic cotton 52 percent increase in searches on organic cotton mm -hmm. so you know we're seeing um, not just on the production side with a 31% increase at the farm level on global organic cotton production. That stat just came out from the organic uh, market report from the textile exchange. Um, but we had, you know, the second largest harvest ever on record in organic cotton in 2019. And we're just getting started. And that is because that younger consumer is demanding this and driving from food to fiber. Um, and the next step hopefully will be, you know, government incentives where we'll see, it could take a long time to get there, but where, you know, they recognize that organic is good business. When you have an industry that is growing, you know, or was growing at double digit rates for so many years and today is continuing to grow. Um, and, you know, you have jobs being created every year, you know, with over 60% of organic businesses are, are adding new jobs every year in America, you see, um, you know, 52% of organic shoppers being millennials. Well, the number one reason people buy organic is generally when they have kids. And so as more and more people, you know, in that generation have kids, they're going to be demanding more organic. Um, so I think, you know, you're, you're seeing, um, we're at the beginning and, uh, only up from here, I do believe. Yeah, we can, you can't underestimate the power of consumer demand. So really get out there and vote with your dollars. Like you said, a lot of farmers are really victims of this system and they would rather be more profitable growing organic, treating their soils better, treating their, their family's health better. So you have the power to do that by what you spend money on and what you demand. Absolutely. And, and demand accountability from those brands and retailers that you do love that aren't necessarily, you know, using organic, write to them, use your social media and, you know, ask them why they're not, you know, using organic cotton instead of conventional cotton in the products um, and show them that you care and that, that it matters. Well, before we jump off for the day, um, just want to let everyone who now knows your story mm -hmm. and all the amazing work they're doing, how can people, uh, what's next for you? How can they find your book? How can they check out your brands? What can people do to stay in touch with all the amazing things you have going on? Thank you. Um, well, I'm redoing my website right now, but it is marcyzeroff.com. Um, my social media, Instagram, Twitter is at Marcy Zeroff. Of course, with my brands, um, definitely check out our new baby, Yes And, at joinyesand.com and on Instagram at Yes And. Um, we have Farm to Home, which is farmtohome.com and at Farm to Home Organic. Of course, at Metaware Organic, if anyone is in the business community out there and is looking for uh, a virtual manufacturing partner that does everything organic. Um, and uh, MetaWork, at MetaOrganic on Instagram as well. So, um, and then look out for, if you follow any one of those brands, you'll be able to, to see our launch uh, on QVC in January with our new baby, our new brand, Seed to Style, which is all organic apparel, which will go from size extra small to 3XL. So I think, will be the first organic brand out there that is so inclusive and really accommodates a, just such a, a wide market. Um, and there'll be so much more coming soon too. So that's great. Well, and book wise, sorry, last, oh, yeah. last book, any, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Whole Foods, uh, Target.com, um, Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy and sustainable world. And um, again, it really uh, is, a, is meant to be a user-friendly 
lifestyle guide uh, with brand. I recommend a lot of brands and a lot of resources and links and tools to really help you take this journey. Um, and thank you, Simon and Schuster as my publisher. So. Yeah, that's great. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for coming thank on. You. Thank you everyone for tuning in for this conversation and definitely um, stay in the loop with Rodale Institute with our, all of our future webinars. Um, thanks so much for coming on and thank you for being a Rodale Institute ambassador to help us bring the organic movement to more people around the world and really understand the why behind it. Thank you. I'm very proud to be a Rodale ambassador and very excited to be here and Thank you for all the great work you're doing and for serving as uh, my Max today. Standing so, host. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> everyone, Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Have a great day.